Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm going to review the Stereo Integrity M3 Carbon 3 inch mid-range. Carbon fiber on the cone and dust cap as well. And you'll also notice that the leads come soldered on from the factory. And one thing I'm going to go ahead and point out here is if you're like me and you tend to route out your uh, holes to be a little bit smaller than what the manufacturer specs and then you go in and you uh, will use a wood rasp or something like that to kind of chisel away a little bit that way you get a really snug fit you will want to be careful doing that with this particular speaker because it's it's so small and the relative size of the solder pads are a little bit wider than you know it, it would be if you had like a big old subwoofer or something so when you go to fit this in place it will create a little bit more of a headache. So um, I actually wound up routering this out twice. And the first time I did it a little bit smaller and then sanded it out. But the second time I actually used the manufacturer's spec and I still had to sand it out a little bit to get this solder tabs to uh, squeeze into place. But just keep that in mind. Another thing is that with this being such a small driver and this is not just for this small driver itself, but for all small drivers, small mid-range drivers especially, is that when you go to mount it, Typically, you're probably going to be mounting it into a three-quarter inch baffle or even a half inch baffle, you know, but either way you go, what you're going to want to do is to make sure that you camphor or chamfer, depending on how you say it, the backside of the mount. And what I mean by that is, I'll show you an example here. This is the baffle that I used to test with, and you can see, you know, it's just bolted in place by the... Uh, screws that they actually give you but on the back side you'll notice that I have a camphor edge going around the reason you want to do that is so you can have as much airflow behind the driver behind the basket as possible because if you don't do that what happens is you'll get a buildup and a restriction of airflow that'll result in a resonance and impedance blip and that will show up not only as a anomaly in the frequency response but also as a form of distortion so make sure that when you use a small driver that you always camfer the backside and allow plenty of room for that driver to breathe in the baffle. Normally, I will post-process the data to put it into a format that I like, but Clipple's actually got a new version of software coming out, and I am a beta tester, so I've been beta testing this and playing around with it. I actually like... Uh, some of the things that they've done in the software as far as the graphings and stuff like that They've really been receptive toward my feedback and I want to go ahead and switch over to their format now Rather than continuing to use my own MATLAB script So I'm going to walk you through that raw data and then once I get finished with it I will post this same data onto my website It's just you guys are getting an early sneak peek rather than me doing what I normally do Which is posting the data to my website and then going to my website to show you the data in the part of the review First things first, I've got the frequency response. This is in 0, 15, and 30 degrees off axis. The average response is in the neighborhood of about 85 dB, and this is taken at 2.83 volts, 1 meter. It's pretty linear through the mid-range, and then when you get to about the 1 kilohertz region, there is a trough in response until about 2.5 kilohertz, and then there is another bump here. I, uh, I'm not exactly sure what this bump is, and even though it's minor, it's just kind of worth noting as far as linearity goes. I think it may be attributed to the dust cap, but I'm not 100% sure. And then once you get beyond that, you get into the beaming point. Now with this speaker being a three inch, the actual surround to surround distance is about two and a half inches. And if you do the math, which I will do for you in real time, speed of sound, 13,500 inches per second divided by two, because I always use half wave for determining the beaming point, and then divided by the actual effective surround, surround edge to surround edge distance. So that's telling me that theoretically that's where I should expect beaming to occur. And you're kind of in that ballpark based on these results where beaming does start to occur. It's uh, closer to maybe the three kilohertz region, but the, the two really, or the three results start to separate more and more. Uh, above that point and if I had the 60 degrees which I didn't do this time because I'm going to start pulling back on all the amount of data um, So you can see that that is expected But overall I would say that most people are probably going to use this between two to three hundred Hertz on the low end Which I would probably personally choose 300 maybe 400 just depending on how loud you listen 
up to about three kilohertz. And the linearity is actually pretty good. I'd say it's about, if you take 85 dB as an average and you run it through, you're at about, what is this? Cross cursor, uh, 83. So you're about one and a half dB down. And then if you go up to 3K, you're about 1.7 dB up. Now, if you're using a three kilohertz low pass filter, then you're gonna chop some of this off. So it's really not uh, not too big of a deal. And you can see the, the main breakup is pushed out well into, I mean, 10 kilohertz. So the polar response of this speaker is really quite well behaved. That means that you could EQ this speaker theoretically and get even response out until about eight to nine kilohertz, but even above that, you're still gonna need a tweeter. So this isn't a drive unit that you could use full range, but it's not marketed to be that either. Now I'm gonna switch over to the field small parameters, which I tested the speaker a multitude of times as I do always where I test it out of the box. I put some power to it for a while. I test it again, I put some power to it for a while and I basically go until it gets to about the same point and the parameters quit changing. And for what it's worth, parameters can change depending on your test method. But I'll say this, this is the first speaker that I've ever tested, quote, out of the box that has given me almost identically, I mean, even to within the tenth of a decimal place of the results that are posted on the Stereo Integrity website. So to me, that implies really good QC. All right, so let's look at this spec here. RE is about three and a half ohms. Uh, let's see, FS is about 114. Uh, MMS is about 4 grams, BL is 3.05, QT 0.83. Some of this stuff is, is nothing important for you guys. So let's skip over to look at the impedance magnitude. And so we're going to look at the fitted curve because the measured shows some resonances from the mounting. So I mentioned the mounting earlier, and when I do my LPM and LSI, so my thill small measurements, I put it into the test stand for the clipple, and there are some things that are reflective in that test stand, so that causes you to get some little impedance blips. So what I'm gonna do for this purpose is we're gonna just look at the fitted portion. And if you look at the fitted, it actually looks quite smooth. Um, the resistance, even all the way out to 10K ohm is still quite low so it's a low inductance driver i would say based off of that now we'll switch back to look at those linear parameters again see what the le is where's le 0 0.0027 milli ohms yeah so this thing's got some copper in it it's a low inductance driver which means that it can play higher in frequency without suffering the effects of the uh of the inductance typically so the next thing we're going to look at is the large signal parameters and we're going to evaluate the uh, speaker itself so there seems to be some of an asymmetry but it's really not bad i mean if you go and look at the symmetry range let's see what that value actually is 0.18 millimeters i mean that's that's the difference in somebody sneezing you know i mean that's, i don't know what to tell you that's really really trivial uh, and then we go look at compliance there is some nonlinear uh, asymmetry as well but I don't think that that's a big deal either. So if we go to the symmetry here and look, yeah, it shifts a little bit from in to out. And we'll go look at cross cursor. So that's 0 0.18 versus 0.19. So even though the, the suspension is rocking a little bit, it's very, 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 very minimal. I mean, we're basically taking a problem. We're blowing this up to a, to a degree that most people just frankly aren't going to care about. And... Then what we also really want to know from this kind of thing, and this being a mid-range, you know, we're going to look at X-Max, but keep in mind, it's going to be a mid-range. So, okay. The limiting factor here is the BL at two millimeters one way, and then the suspension is limited to 2.2 millimeters one way, and the distortion components from inductance are greater than, so it hadn't even been determined yet, uh, greater than 3.2 millimeters. So, that again implies that we've got some good copper going on here. So the BL is limiting factor at two millimeters one way, but it being a basically two and a half inch mid-range uh, cone diameter. Okay, that's not bad. That's, I mean, that's reasonable to me. We're gonna look at distortion components. So this is 2.83 volts, and we're gonna look at harmonic distortion. So this is the harmonic distortion with 2.83 volts mean sensitivity is at about 85 db so at about 85 db 
you are below 3% THD down to 100, but you're going to be using this as a mid range. So let's say you're crossing it at 300, you're below negative uh, 40, so that's 1%. So you're below 1% above 200 hertz. This is really quite good. Now I do stepped uh, voltages, and so if we take that and we add 6 dB to it, now what do we have? Well, so it'll be 91 dB output, and here we go. So at 91 dB output, wide open, above 300 hertz, you're still close to above or below 1% THD. Uh, across the board so again quite good and if we bump this up to my max testing which is plus 12 db right now so 85 db plus 12 db is 97 db so let's look at that result for 97 db and you can see of course the low low frequency is just ramping up astronomically but again this is a mid-range it's a two and a half inch mid-range drive unit so if we go back and look at the intended range the most likely range you're at about, maybe that's 2% THD, uh, give or take. And I mean, yeah, you're, you're well below the 3% mark that I have here for negative 30. And you're probably closer to around 2 to 1% above 300 hertz. So yeah, to me, this is really, really good uh, harmonic distortion graphs for its intended use. And now we're going to look at intermod distortion. Now, intermod distortion is what happens when you play a drive unit low in frequency and higher frequency at the same time because you don't play just one tone you play multiple tones that's how you get complex music signals and if we switch over I'm going to close this stuff out no 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 this imd so if i play it at fs which is 114 hertz and then i also sweep the voice range from 300 hertz to 6 kilohertz all right, so right now this is set to 9 volts, and if I compare 9 volts to 2.83 volts, that is a difference of about 10 dB. So if I add 10 dB to the 2.83 volt sensitivity measurement, now we're at 95 dB. So at 95 dB, uh, this is what your intermod distortions look like, and um, that's that's pretty high. I mean, honestly, that's that's pretty high. But you're playing a speaker, actually this is playing from 200 hertz and up. So you're playing at 114 hertz, so you're playing it right at FS, and then you're playing at 200 hertz and up. So let's see what happens when you put it to where you know you would expect it to be played. And let's say you your your lowest frequency was 200 hertz, okay? Because realistically, it's going to be 300, but we're just going to play around. We're going to see what happens when it's 200 hertz. Look how much lower that is. See how much lower that is? That's the difference in playing at 114 hertz versus it playing at 200 hertz and also playing these other frequencies at the same time. So guarantee you, if I played 300 hertz as my bass note, my lowest possible bass note, then this intermod distortion would be super low. Now this is at 95 dB, so I think this is okay for it also playing 200 hertz, something that you're probably not likely to do with this drive unit. I don't see anything here that makes me go, you know, this is a this is a bad drive unit. In fact, I think it's a pretty good drive unit. And if I were testing it, you know, at 300 hertz and then sweeping a higher frequency and voice range, then these values would be even lower. But since the purpose of IMD testing is to play a bass tone and sweep the voice range, that's what I did. I just picked some lower bass tones for this drive unit. Now, I haven't tested a whole lot of you know, three inch mid ranges. But what I can tell you is that this is probably the most linear one that I recall seeing in quite some time in terms of frequency response, which is way more important in terms of how you hear than distortion itself. There's a lot of copper inside of this motor to help lower IMD products. So if you were to try to play it lower into the base region, then that's a help, but more than likely you're not. And in that case, the distortion is going to be kept even lower than it would be if you were trying to push it below 200 Hertz. Um, I would recommend it typical mid-range region 300 to 3 kilohertz you can go a little bit below that or above that if you want depending on what what you're after but i think it's a really good performer just make sure you stick with the note i mentioned previously about making sure that you chamfer or camfer the back side of the mounting and that's it for this video i appreciate you watching and i hope you learned something i hope you enjoyed it I hope you got something useful from it if you liked it please give it a thumbs up go ahead and hit subscribe if you haven't already so that's it you guys take care talk to you later And now for the giveaway. All right, Nick, the owner of Stereo Integrity was kind enough to send these out to me for testing and to give away. They were plucked off the production line 
And he said, when you're done testing them, feel free to set up a giveaway for them. And the lucky winner will win themselves a free pair of Stereo Integrity M3 Carbon mid-ranges. How do you enter? I don't do giveaways through YouTube and there's reasons for that. I do them through my Facebook group. So if you are not part of my Facebook group, I'm gonna throw the link up down here somewhere and you can type it in. Just go there and join. And if you are already a member, all you gotta do is watch out when I post this review for this driver. I'll throw the YouTube view review up there. Yeah, that's all you gotta do. Just go and like the post where I post the video link for this particular review and that's it. So hope you guys enjoy it. And that's my way of helping pay back to the community. And I'd like to thank Nick again for generously offering the opportunity for me to give these away. So it's really cool of him to do. He didn't have to do it. So that's it. You guys take care. Talk to you later.